All right, this is the last hour of Physics 1C for March 16th. I think we're recording, right? Yep. All right, so we want to figure out uh, the equivalent capacitance in this picture over here where all values are shown in microfarads. So I'm going to go ahead and redraw this over here so we can, we can use our own diagram. So we start off with uh, a connection that starts off with a point A right here. And we've got a few different capacitors that are connected together. One right here, and then a branch where we get two right here. I don't think that's going to be enough room because we're going to need to write in between everything. So let's leave a lot of room between these two. So then there's one here, one down here, and those connect back up here. And down here we have kind of a repeat of the same thing. We have a lot of room. This one comes from another book because the examples in your book are just so simple. The University of Physics book, I don't say your book, the book we're using. The examples are just so incredibly simple that... Uh, It really just, I don't know. I don't know how much you're supposed to learn from something where it's just really basic. So one microfarad, three microfarad. This is eight. This is six. And this is two. So we end up having a combination of multiple capacitors connected in, in various connections of series in parallel. And our goal is to find first the equivalent capacitance between points A and B here. And then we also want to find if the potential difference between A and B is uh, 120 volts, we want to find the charge on every capacitor. This is going to be what most of your homework problems in this chapter uh, are like. So let's go about doing it. The first thing we're going to do is say that these two the one microfarad and the three microfarad, how are they connected with each other? Are they in parallel or are they in series? Parallel. Parallel. That's right, they're in parallel. And the six and the two are also in parallel, right? So we're just going to take those two, there's a little circle here, and we're just going to reduce them down into their equivalent capacitance, and we'll do the same thing here. So what that'll look like when we redraw our diagram, so we're gonna just kind of go downwards here. When we redraw our diagram, what it's gonna look like is we're gonna have, that one's still gonna be four. The three and the four are gonna to combine together. The two and the six are gonna to combine together. And we're gonna get something that looks kind of like this. Where that's gonna be four microfarads. This is going to be four. Now six and two, if we do one over six plus one over two, and we take that to the negative one power, what do you get? A sixth, this is a two, so a sixth plus three sixths um, would be four sixths. one and a half. You get 1.5, right? Is that really what we get? Do we really get 1.5? Yeah, that's what you get, right? Oh. I am really sorry. Okay, good thing I know that that's not right. That's not how we do it. These two are in parallel, right? How do we add capacitors that are in parallel? Just add them together. Just add them together. So 6 plus 2 is going to be 8. I'm sorry for the confusion there. On the top up here, we have 1 and 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. And that's all we can do. Ah, so it's for this part. These two are in series. Right? So if I want to connect together the 4 and the 4, I would have to do 1 over 4 plus 1 over 4. And then take that to the negative 1 power, and I think you're going to get 2. 
So then this picture here, when we reduce it down, we can reduce the top two down to just one capacitor. That's going to be two microfarads. And then we'll have on the bottom, what are these two? If you take one over eight plus one over eight, what are those going to reduce down to? Four. Just four. Mm -hmm. So this down here is going to be four. And then finally, those reduce down to six, right? So we're basically just left with one capacitor that has an equivalent capacitance, this is the answer to part A, of six microfarads. Do you have any questions? So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, suppose that we connect between points A and B. So this is still point A and this is still point B. Suppose we place a 120 volts uh, DC voltage source across these two points. We want to calculate what the charge on every single capacitor is going to be. I don't know if we'll do every one of them, but we'll, we'll kind of highlight out what we need to do. And we might need some room to work with, so we might move this somewhere over here or something. Okay, so our goal is to find the charge in every capacitor. I'm not gonna draw this 120 volts everywhere, but just remember that basically we're applying 120 volts between points A and B. Now, the way to do this is not to start from the beginning and try to just predict what these charges are gonna be. That's very difficult. It is much easier to start from the end and work your way backwards, okay? So the first thing would to do here would be to say that on this, uh, capacitor here that has 120 volts and six microfarads, we can find the kind of total capacitance that you get on this object here. And, or sorry, the total charge. The total charge is gonna be given by this expression, Q equal to C times delta V. So in this case, that's gonna be six microfarads multiplied by 120 volts. So this is gonna be 120 times six, which is 720, I think. So this would be kind of like the total, we'll call this Q total if you want to, the total amount of charge that's stored within our system here, okay? Now we go backwards, okay? And we look at these two here, all right? And for every one of our capacitors, there are three values that we're gonna write down. We already have them for some of them. You can have a Q, a C, and a delta B. We have the C written for all of them, basically, right? And so we're just going to continually apply this equation over and over again until we fill out our entire circuit, okay? Now, the first thing to do is to say these two are in parallel with each other, right? So as we move backwards, so I'll put an arrow. We're kind of going back in this direction now. We came from something that had a, had a voltage of 120 volts. These two would also be subject to that same voltage, right? Again, we're putting, we're putting 120 volts across our whole system here, right? So what's the voltage across the four microfarad capacitor gonna be? Is it gonna be some fraction of 120? Is it gonna be equal to 120? What's it equal to? Keeping in mind that these are in parallel. Wouldn't it be 120? Yeah. So this is gonna have a voltage of 120 volts. This is gonna have a voltage of 120 volts. And now we can find the charge, right? Because the charge is just C times delta B. So right above those, I'm gonna write the charge. Maybe we'll write all of our charges in the in red or something. So the charge is C times delta V, so 120 times two means that the charge is equal to 240. Is it okay if I don't write that, write that out completely? Basically, you're just gonna take this times this and you'll get the one above it. For this one down here, the charge is gonna be equal to four times 120, so the charge is gonna be 480 microcoulombs. Now, you'll notice that 240 plus 480 is equal to 720, right? All right, let's go backwards again. Now, when we go back to the left again, we're still applying that same voltage to the whole system here. 120 volts. 
But now, we don't really know immediately what the voltage across each of these are gonna be because they're in series. But what we can do is we can use one of the things that I told you to remember earlier about things that are in series. What did I say about two conductors, sorry, two capacitors that are in series? What do we know about them? What is the same for each of them? The total charge. The charge, right? So what you do is you say this charge has to be the same for each of these. This has to be 480. And this has to be 480. You basically use the value you got here because the four microfarad capacitor came from squishing these two together. And we said that this it also has to carry the exact same charge. What's the charge on the upper two going to be? Two forty. Yeah, it's going to be this one, because it because these two squish down to the top one, right? So this is going to be two hundred and forty microcoulombs. This is going to be two hundred and forty microcoulombs. Now we've actually solved for this one and this one now already, right? So we just have the six and the two and the one and the three up here, right? How do I get information about those? Well, this one, eight microfarads, came from this six and two above it, right? Six plus two is eight. And what do we know is gonna be the same as we go backwards now from this one to this one here? What's gonna be the same? What's gonna hold true as we go backwards? The voltage. The voltage, because these are in parallel. Now, do I know the voltage on this one? Not yet, but we can find it, right? Because we have C, and we've got Q, and delta V is Q over C, right? So in this case, I guess I'll write this one out. If I write 480 microcoulomb, and I divide by 8 microfarads, the micros will cancel, and what we get? 480 over 8, that's 60, right? So if I know that this one has 60 volts, right? then these two have to be 60 volts. This is 60 volts, and this is 60 volts, because they're in parallel. And we can use that to find our charges. So 60 times six is 360 for the top one. 60 times two is 120 for the bottom one. So again, what we did was we said it's parallel. So whatever it turned into, they must have the same voltage. So 60 volts down here, which we got by doing, uh, what was it, 480 mm -hmm. divided by eight, and you apply it right back there. What is the voltage on these two gonna be? Well, these came from here. What's the voltage on this gonna be? Can you can you all calculate that? What's the voltage on this one gonna be? You can kind of do it in your head if you also, want to. It would also be 60, right? Yeah, it turns out to be 60 as well. 240 over four is also 60, okay? Because of all the equal numbers in this one, this just ends up happening. We'll look at my problems later that won't be so simple. So if this is 60 volts, this has to be 60 volts, this has to be 60 volts, which means that for the charge, this one's gonna be uh, 60 microcoulombs, and this one's gonna be 180 microcoulombs. There's a lot of things you can check with these. 180 plus 60 is equal to 240. Uh, what's this one? Um, ooh, that's not right, I'm so sorry. I put microfarad right here. It should've been microcoulombs for the charge, I'm so sorry. Really sorry about that. Anyway, that's that's how you do these. This looks quite messy. It looks quite messy, and I apologize, but that's basically the uh, the way in which you would do this. Usually, when I do this on the board, I I have just a lot more space to work with. Trying to keep everything on one page here, which is maybe a problem. Maybe I should just be using more space. Um, you know, I would basically put one of these on one board, this on another board, this on another board, this on another board, and then you could basically go, and you'd have plenty of room to write everything in and be neat and stuff, but it didn't work out so well here. Anyway, that's how you do these type of problems. Does, uh, does anyone have any questions? Professor, you said that the total charge in the whole system was 720? Yeah. But looking at the, the diagram at the bottom left, I think the charges add up to more than that, right? Well, remember that the internal charges here cancel. So 480 plus 240 is 720, right? Mm -hmm. 
and it looks like maybe there's twice as much charge. But what you have to remember is that this one's positive and this one's negative and this one's positive and this one's negative. So when we combine these two together here, the positive and negative in between them cancels out. So the total okay. charge, does that make sense? Yeah. So that's how you end up getting, this, then this ends up being positive and this ends up being negative. So yeah, that's a good point. That's a good question. Okay. So um, I guess, Sure, what I'm gonna do? I, I kind of want to just do more of these problems, um, honestly, uh, instead of introducing energy. And we can talk about energy next time. I think I think that's a fair thing to do. So I've got some really good versions of these problems, which is to say that uh, I've got some that are kind of tricky. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you about five minutes or so to try to work them out for yourselves, and then we'll try to solve them. So. Here's our problem that I want you to look at. And there's another one as well that if you finish this one, you can try. But we'll go through them in order. And I'll probably give you time for each of them as we're doing them. I think we can do both of these before class is over. Might as well give it a shot. So these are the two problems I want you to look at. We'll do them in order. And uh, yeah, what I'd like you to do is to look at these there's the one right there and this is the one right here these both come from a different textbook but you're going to see problems like this in your homework and uh yeah so the first one it says find the equivalent capacitance between points a and b for the group of capacitors connected as shown take c1 equal to 5 c2 equal to 10 and c3 equal to 2 microfarads and then for the network described of the previous problem, if the potential difference between points A and B is 60 volts, what is the charge stored on QC3? And really, we're going to find the charge on everything, honestly. And then if you can finish this one in the time, I don't think you, it's five minutes is just not enough time for that one, probably. But if you can, then you're going to look at this one over here. Okay. And I'll probably give you time in between to look at this one. Um, the one thing I'll tell you about this problem is that it is, is drawn in such a way to intentionally trick you. So take your time with it. Um, take your time with trying to, to solve it. One thing I will say is that these capacitors, you can move them anywhere you want as long as you don't pass through another capacitor and you don't pass through a junction like this or like this. So for example, I could take C2 right here and I can move it anywhere along this line if it made it simple for me to understand what was going on, okay? I could take C3, and I really can't move it very far. I can't pass these junctions. I can move it up and down. So I think of it as, imagine that these are wires, and imagine that the, um, the capacitors are like little beads that are constrained to the wire. I think about like those toys where you have those like big wire frames and you've got little beads that you can you can move around on. Like that's kind of the way you can manipulate these. You can also bend and change these wires. Again, as long as you don't change the connections. Like the right side of this needs to be connected to here. The left side of this needs to be connected to the left side of this. Okay, so I think I probably said too much. I'm probably overwhelming you, but just because it's drawn like this doesn't mean that you can change the way that it's drawn every one of these lines is a wire okay it's not a, it's not like a rigid thing so yeah anyway give it a shot see if you can solve this problem and we'll come back and we'll uh, look at it so we'll give you five minutes we'll talk again and uh, at 432 433 or so and if you um if you have a question feel free to ask
Okay. That's about five and a half minutes or so. If you weren't able to solve, don't worry about it. This problem's really hard. If you were, that's great. All right, so we're going to redraw this. Move this one off to the side for now. All right, so we've got uh, all these capacitors connected up as shown. We'll draw a bigger version of it so we can actually write on it. So we start off and we say, okay, we've got... So I'm, I'm immediately going to re redraw this in a way. Uh, I think that's the right answer, actually, or something close to that, Cam. All right, so I'm going to redraw this immediately in a way that's probably easier to see. C1 and C2, how are those connected to each other? Are they in series or are they in parallel? Parallel? In series. Yeah, they're actually in series. It looks like they're in parallel just because of the way the drawing is drawn. But if you think about it, if you, if you were to start from here and try to move up to here... You draw a line, you pass through both of them. So the way I'm going to draw it is just like this. I'm going to stack them here. And I'll try to argue that it's the same thing. I'm going to draw them like this and like this. And then it should become clear that they are actually in series. Same thing on the right-hand side. Let's actually label the numbers in here. So do I have to write microfarad for everything? I probably should. The top one is C1, which is 5. The bottom one is C2, which is 10. Same over here, right? And these two are connected in parallel. Let's see if you can see the difference between them. I'll try to indicate what the difference is and why the bottom ones are parallel and the ones on the left and right at the top are not. These are 10 as well. Okay, so the difference between these bottom two, right, is if you look at this point and this point right here, you can see that I can draw a line up through C2 and get to here, and I can draw a line and get to the one on the right and get back to here without actually passing through the two capacitors. Okay, and so that's what basically makes them in parallel, is because they're both connected to this point in the circuit separately. You can't really say the same thing about these ones on top, okay? There's really no way to draw a line. See how I can basically, here, let me draw it in yellow so it's like maybe more clear. I can start from point B, and I can get all the way through this capacitor and get back to here without ever touching C2, right? And I can do the same thing on the other side. I can start from point B, and I can go through C2, and I can get to here, and I never crossed C, the other C2, right? So that's what makes them parallel. There's no way you can do that over here. Say that I want to get from this point to this point up here. There's no way that I can do it without crossing through this capacitor and this capacitor, right? It's impossible. So as a result, these have to be in series, okay? And again, like I was saying, we can move these. I can move this one down to here, and I can move this one up to here, and I haven't changed anything at all. And yet, these are very clearly in series, right? So any, any questions about that? All right, so after we've done this, our goal is to find the equivalent capacitance of the whole network, which means we need to start breaking it down piece by piece. So let's start with these two right here. They're connected in series. So when they're connected in series, I have to add the inverses. So I need to do one over five plus one over 10. And I need to take the inverse of that. Um, this is like two tenths. Sorry, so this is like 2 tenths, so I believe this is going to give us 3.33. Because 2 tenths plus 1 tenth is 3 tenths. You take the inverse, that should be 3.33 microfarads. Same thing with this one here. The 2 tens are in parallel, so what are they going to reduce down to? 0.2. Yep. You just add them together. All right, so what we end up getting is a circuit that looks like this now. So we still have the two microfarad in the middle, but now on either side of it, we've got a capacitor over here, a capacitor over here. And on the bottom, we have 10 and 10, which we said was 20. So we end up getting 20 microfarad here, 
got 3.33. We still got the two in the middle. Let's go down this way now. 3.33, 2, and 3.33 are all in parallel with each other. Again, if you can't see that they're in parallel, although this one's pretty obvious, you can apply the same test. I can go from here to here and pass through just the two. I can go from here up to here and just pass through that one. So they're in parallel, which means we can add them all together. We can't include this one, though, because it's going to be in series with the combination of all of them. So this is going to reduce down to 2 plus 3 plus 3 is 8.66, I believe. So we'll have 8.66. And we still have another 20 down here. And to get the final equivalent capacitance, we're going to need to do 1 over 8.66 plus 1 over 20. Uh, let's do that over here. So 1 divided by 8.66 plus 1 divided by 20 to the negative 1 microfarads. I think you're going to get 6. Yeah, about 6.0. Did you get 6.05 because you included like more digits, Cam? I guess if we if we I did I didn't uh, I was I didn't do any rounding. Yeah, that's the proper way to do it, I guess. But uh, we'll just say to uh, to two sig figs, this is equal to six. Microfarads. And that's the answer. That's going to be the equivalent capacitance. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Are we going to go over the next problem? Yeah, we definitely have time to do that. OK. We probably have time to do more after that as well. So point A and B is here. It's here and here. And it says, for the network described in the previous problem, if the potential difference between points A and B is 60 volts, what is the charge stored on Q3? All right, so we're attaching, right here, we're going to attach a battery. And it has a potential difference of 60 volts. And our goal is to find the charge stored on this one. So in order to do that, we need to kind of work our way back through the circuit. We don't have to find the charge stored on every single capacitor, although it might be educational to do so. I don't know. Let's see. So here's what we do. Everything is going to be using this equation, Q equal to C times delta V. We're going to use that over and over and over again, right? Because it's the only equation we really have. So looking at these two right here, something's missing, right? What's missing? We've got a voltage. We've got a capacitance. We're missing yeah, the charge. the charge, right? So what's the charge going to be? So for these two, the charge would be equal to 60 times 6 which is about 360, right? All right. As we move from back in this direction here, what's going to be the same as we move from the left picture to the right picture over here? Is it going to be the charge? Is it going to be the charge or is it going to be the voltage? Voltage. These are in series, right? What's the same for things that are in series? Is it voltage or charge? Oh, the charge. Sorry, I meant, yeah, the voltage is does change. So these, so these should have the exact same charge. That means this should be 360 microcoulombs for this one, and this should be 360 microcoulombs for this one. Let's write out all of our voltages in green, actually. So to find the voltage, we just do delta V is going to be equal to charge divided by capacitance, right? So this one's not so easy, but if we divide these... We should get delta V, the potential difference. I got 41.6. It'd be a lot of rounding here. So if your numbers you're getting are just slightly different, don't worry too much about it. 
got to do Q over C down here. So we would divide this one by 20. That's a little easier to do. This will give us a delta V of 18. It's always a good idea to check that these add together to give you the number over here. 42 plus 18 does in fact give us that number. There's a lot of rounding issues now because I, I heavily rounded this. So these aren't gonna be perfect, but it's fine. Uh, then we go back this way and uh, what's gonna be the same? These are in parallel. What's the same for parallel? Voltage. Yep, so that means that these are all gonna have the same delta V of 41.6. So that means uh, our, this is the one we wanted to find the answer for, right? But let's just do them all. So we know that this is going to have delta V equal to 41.6 volts, and they're all going to have the same. So let's just copy paste that. So this one in the middle is going to be delta V equal to that. And then over here on the left, it's going to be delta V equal to that. And if we want to find the charge for this one, for example, the charge is going to be equal to C times delta V. So it's equal to, and again, this is C. I'm not labeling these as C. I hope that's not confusing anyone too much, although I'm sure it is. 3.33 uh, times 41.6. So I got 139 or so, roughly. So the charge on these is going to be 139 microcoulomb. The same thing over here because it's the same. This would also be 139 microcoulombs. And now for the one we actually wanted to know, we're going to do C times delta V here. It looks like it's going to be like 82, 83.2, I think. If we multiply those, we'll just check. 41.6 times 2 is 83.2. Yep. And that's our answer, actually. And technically, we even solved everything else because since the 5 and the 10 were in series and they reduced down to this, they're going to have the same uh, charge. These are going to be 139, 139. Same thing over here. The only ones we didn't do are these tens, and those would come from here. These would be, these are parallel. They turned into a 20. So this would be 18 volts, and this would be 18 volts coming from down here. And then our charge, of course, would be 18 times 10, which is... 180 and 180. That's it. That's how we do it. Anyone have any questions? So do you, do you recommend working backwards mm -hmm. of the, uh, mm -hmm. like you find the equivalent first yeah. and then you could go backwards? Yeah. Assuming that, so some, the university of physics just, they love doing really weird things. Assuming that they don't do something like tell you what the equivalent capacitance is. So there, there, I think you might have one or two problems where they tell you this. And for example, they might have left this as an unknown. Okay, so imagine the same problem, but C3 is not known, but they tell you this number, and then they force you to work back and figure out what that is. That might happen. I, I, there might be one problem like that. I don't know. But for the most part, yes. This is almost always what you're going to do. You're going to be given a capacitor network, and even if they don't ask you to find the equivalent capacitance, if they, for example, if this was the only problem that you were given, right? You should know that if you want to find the charge stored, or later on we might ask you what the energy stored is, then you'll do the same process. You'll just you'll break it down into one capacitor, and then you'll walk back through it to find all the unknowns, basically. Yeah. That's how you do it. Will you always have to do this? Maybe not. Maybe, it's, maybe for some problems you, you don't have to do this process at all, but for most of them, yeah, I'd say that's, that's kind of the, the procedure. All right. Let's see if I can give you like a minute or two to, to think about this one now. And see if you can't at least find the equivalent capacitance.
And um, I don't know, I guess I could zoom out so you can compare it to this one. So take, take a couple minutes and see if you can at least set up the steps for how you would do this one here. And again, it's drawn in a tricky way. But, uh, you know, don't let it trick you too much because it's because it's, you can... Hmm, I don't know how much I want to tell you. Just try to give it a shot because I want you to struggle with it and then we'll talk about how to do it. So I'll give you two minutes. We'll start again at 4.51 or so. How did you get the micro to show up? Did you copy paste it or? On Max, if you press Control Command Space, mm -hmm. at the same time, it brings up a whole display of um, special characters. Oh, okay. So this is like, yeah. Okay, I hope that was enough time to at least think about this. Again, if you didn't get the answer, it's. That's totally fine. I just really wanted you to take some time to think about it, that's all. So that I'm not just rushing through things without you having time to consider what's going on. Okay, so this is again drawn in a tricky way and we're gonna we're gonna simplify it a little bit. Now we're we're gonna start off by simplifying the easy part first, which is how are the seven and the five connected to each other? Are they in parallel or in are they series? They're clearly in series, right? Because they're, you know, right next to each other in the circuit, right? So we'll just, uh, we'll basically just almost exactly redraw it, and then, um, then we're gonna, then we're gonna kind of bend the wires, so to speak, and make it a little simpler to understand what's going on here. So we could reduce down the two middle ones into, into one. Oops, like that. Maybe this one is easier than the first one. I really don't know. I, I guess it just depends on how how hard it is to look at this. Uh, okay, so we would have 4MF here. 
we would have in the middle here, we would need to do 1 over 5 plus 1 over 7. Take that to the negative 1 power. Our answer is going to be in microfarads. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Like 0.2 plus 0.14. It's like 0.34. It's going to be like 3-ish. Point nine two. So we get two point nine two here in the middle. I don't know where to write this. I guess I could write sideways. Two point nine two. Enough. I don't know why it's it's really it feels really weird writing diagonally on this tablet because I want to I want to turn the tablet, but if you turn it and then try to write diagonally, it's uh, gonna write straight. Anyway, this was six. And now you just have to ask yourself, how are these connected? Are they series or parallel? And maybe it's obvious that they're in, in parallel. I don't know. But yeah. what I would say is that what you can do is I can take this wire right here. I think, yeah, I'm going to let me grab it. And it doesn't change the circuit in any way for me to move the wire to here. And, you know, I, I don't know how you're supposed to develop that intuition or whatever, but um, similar to what we were saying earlier about how the electric potential is the same at all points along the wire, um, it really just doesn't matter where I put this wire. It doesn't change anything like that. And if we do that, it starts to look a lot more like we did before, and then we can just kind of rotate the circuit. Because now all we need to do is basically just bend this wire down this way and bend this wire up this way, and then just twist the whole thing by about 45 degrees, and you get a circuit that looks pretty simple. So again, this, this one is just drawn in such a way to make it look weird. Um, but in fact, it's, it's really not that complicated at all. <laughs> because, if, because if it was drawn this way, it would have it been a really easy problem. But that's the kind of stuff you'll see on your homework. It's just, yeah. So to, add the, to do these, we need to basically just say, oh, we just do 4 plus 2.92 plus 6 equals 12.92 microfarads, right? That's it, because they're in series, or they're in parallel, sorry. All right, does that all make sense? Anyone have any questions? I hope we've done enough today to help set you up for your homework, but if there are homework problems that you get stuck on, let me know. I will ask you now that we've done a lot of these. Does this seem harder, easier, or about the same as what we've done in the previous chapters? Easier. Way easier. It's a lot easier, right? Okay. Just to make sure that you all didn't think I was lying to you at the beginning of the semester when I told you the first month was the worst, but then it gets easier. So this month this month of, of physics hopefully should be... And by this month, I don't just mean March. I mean the next... Basically, probably right up until spring break. And then after spring break, it'll get a little challenging again for about a month. And then the last month will be pretty easy, too. Now, let's see what we can do... Uh, our goal was to cover capacitors and capacitance, parallel plate capacitors. We did that. We looked at capacitors in series and parallel. So the next thing to do would be to talk about the energy that's stored inside of a capacitor. And we can do this relatively quickly, actually. So let's just talk about the theory for that. And uh, that'll leave us with less to do next time. So we saw in something we did earlier that, that uh, capacitors could release energy in very short bursts. And uh, we'd like to know something about how much energy do they actually release. So to do this, what we do is we start off with a circuit. So we got a battery. We connect it up to a capacitor. The battery is going to have a potential difference that we call capital delta V. No, delta V, like that. And our capacitor has a capacitance C. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at the process by which the capacitor gets stored up. But we're going to look at the process by which the capacitor gets charged up. All right. So let's suppose that at some point in time, 
before the capacitor is done charging, so this capacitor is kind of in the process of charging up, So the capacitor is charging up, right? Let's say that at a moment in time, we know that there is a total charge that we call Q on our capacitor. So positive Q over here on the left plate and negative Q over here on the right plate. And what we want to do is we want to, we want to charge the capacitor up more until it reaches its maximum charge, which we'll call Q max, okay? And in order to do that, we imagine that we take a tiny amount of charge from within our wire right here and we're gonna call that tiny amount of charge as we often do, we're gonna call it DQ, okay? And we're gonna figure out the work needed to put DQ on this plate. So that's what we're gonna calculate, the work needed to move DQ, a tiny amount of charge from within the wire onto the left plate. So if it's a positive charge, would you all agree that it's going to take energy or take work to push this charge into this plate right here, which already has positive charge? Does that make sense? It takes work to do that. Yes. Because this is positive, that's positive. You're trying to push a positive on something that's already positive. All right. Now, that's okay because the battery is going to do it for us. So we're not physically doing this ourselves. The battery is what's doing this, right? Okay. Now, the next thing to say is let's say that the potential difference at a moment in time on our plates, at this point in time, we call delta V, but we use like a little V like this, okay? So delta V, where I, where I write it like this, so it looks like a smaller V, is gonna represent the instantaneous, instantaneous voltage on the plates or the instantaneous potential difference on the plates. I should really say potential difference. Anyway, okay. So what we know is that the work needed to move such a charge onto plates that have a potential difference of delta V, the work should be equal to, and it's gonna be a small amount of work, okay? I'll just write here work so it's clear what I'm writing should be equal to the size of the charge, dq, multiplied by delta v. This is just one of the things we know, work is equal to q delta v. Really, it's negative, but we're not gonna worry about that for now. The sign isn't important. Okay, so if I have a charge q and I wanna push it onto a plate that has a potential difference delta v, that's the work that's gonna be needed, okay? Now, the instantaneous voltage on the plates, delta v, should be equal to, according to our general equation that we've been using all throughout this chapter, the charge on the plates Q divided by C, and little q is basically gonna be also the instantaneous charge on those plates, okay? So it's it's not the maximum charge, it's not zero, it's something in between, all right? Because our, our plates are basically charging up like this. If we plotted um, uh, the charge on the plates over here, Q, as a function of voltage. I think that's how I wanna write it. Maybe I wanna change these right here. I don't, I don't think it really matters. Um, this is kind of what's going on. We're trying to charge up our capacitor to a maximum charge Q max and to a maximum voltage that will be equal to the voltage of the battery delta V right here. And at that point, we're gonna reach maximum charge. And it's gonna kind of follow a line like this right here, right? We're, we're slowly, it's, at first, there's no charge on the plates, right? And as charge builds up on the plates, you get more and more potential difference on the plates right here, okay? Because delta V is proportional to Q. And the ratio of, between the two of them is one over C, which will be just a straight line like this. All right. But, uh, but yeah, it takes more and more work to keep piling charges on there. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we want to do this process over here. We want to pile some charge DQ onto our plate that has, a, uh, has an instantaneous voltage delta V. And what we know is that delta V is equal to Q over C. So if you plug that in here, we're going to have Q over C DQ. 
and on the left side we have the work done. We integrate both sides, and the right hand, left hand side is going to become the work. The right hand side is going to be one over c, which is a constant. We're going to integrate from zero charge on the plates up to q max. Okay, and the integral we're doing is just q dq. Really, an easy integral to do, right? What is this integral equal to? Q max squared divided by two. It's the integral is just q squared over two. And we have to evaluate it from zero to q max. So just like you said, the work needed to charge the capacitor completely up, and this work is done by the battery, should be equal to q max squared divided by two c. And what we're gonna say is that this is gonna be equivalent to the energy that gets stored up in the capacitor in the form of potential energy. So this is the energy stored in the capacitor. Now, if we were taking a, uh, um, if we were taking a uh, physics 2B course, what I would say is that the work would be the area under this curve. And the area under this curve would end up also being Q max squared over 2C. Anyway, I think I did that. I don't know. I'm not trying not to think too hard about this because I want to get to the end of all this. So here, this is the energy stored then. It's related to the charge squared divided by 2C. But we can write that in two different ways, two different other ways, I should say. Again, we have this equation that tells us that Q is equal to C times delta V, right? So we can eliminate the charge inside of here. We can say that the energy stored in a capacitor can be written as either Q squared over 2C, or if I plug in Q squared here, what I'm gonna get is C squared delta V squared over two C. But then one of these C's cancel out and we end up getting one half C times delta V squared. We could also do something different. We could have replaced the C inside of here. So because according to this equation, C is equal to Q over delta V, Replacing the C in this equation, we would get Q squared divided by C, which is Q divided by delta V. There's still a two down here. And then this one, one of the Qs would cancel out. The delta V would go to the numerator and we would get one half I thought for a second that was a squared. It's not, it's times two times two. You get one half Q times delta V. So these are the three definitions here. Let's write like this. Equals, so this is the energy stored in the capacitor. Energy stored in the capacitor, we use U because U is uh, what we use for potential energy. And we got that definition. We got that definition. We've got this definition here. And there we go. I should have uh, inverted these axes, by the way. That's what I did wrong. This should have been Q, and this should have been delta V. And I can fix that real quick, but as I'm doing that, does anyone have any questions? Um, one is... What is most often used in practice, if this is, if this potential energy is used in practice? Which of these equations? Um, what? I mean, is it, do we measure capacitance more? So like in real life, people measure capacitance and the potential difference. So it'd be like one half C delta V squared. Oh, yeah. which, which one do you use? Well, 
the charge is really hard to measure unless you know the capacitance and the voltage. So I, I would say this one is the easiest to use kind of like in practice. Because voltage, like, as we saw earlier, if you're using a capacitor, you're going to know the value of C, and you're probably going to know the value of delta B. You might not know Q. Now, of course, you could always find it, right? So I think that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, these seem like the more measurable. These are like the measurables, you might say. Mm. Well, delta B is a measurable. C would be known, usually. Okay. That's that. It's five tens. We gotta stop.